Hi everybody, I am Jen Johnson and you are watching Thought by Thought Healing where I like to get on here and talk about everything related to reversing chronic pain and chronic symptoms. I come at this from a Christian perspective and so if that is inspiring to you, then you should definitely subscribe. Today I have the unbelievable humbling honor of having Dr. Howard Schubiner with me today. And so stay tuned to hear all the wonderful things that he has to say about all the hope that we have when it comes to understanding how our chronic pain can be reversed. So thank you. And without further ado, here he is. Hi, everybody. I am Jen Johnson, and you are watching Thought by Thought Healing. And I am beyond excited to have Dr. Howard Schubiner with us today. Welcome, Dr. Howard Schubiner. Hello, hello. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, thanks for being here. Um, Dr. Howard Schubiner is an internist and the director of the Mind Body Medicine Center at Ascension Providence Hospital in Southfield, Michigan. And he's also a clinical professor at the Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. He has authored more than 100 publications in scientific journals and in books and lectures regionally, nationally, and internationally. Dr. Schubiner is the senior teacher of Mind Mindfulness Meditation, and the author of three books, Unlearn Your Pain, Unlearn Your Anxiety and Depression, and Hidden from Few, written with Dr. Ellen Abbas. Dr. Schubiner lives in the Detroit area with his wife of 37 years and his two adult children. Um, Dr. Howard Schubiner has a huge imprint in my life, not only in my healing journey, but also just in being prepared to be a mind-body um, coach. And so I am so unbelievably grateful to you literally for giving me the tools to take back my whole life. Um, we don't want to get into my story, but um, you are just such a huge part of it. So thank you for the work that you are doing, um, that you have done for me and for all the people that are affected by you. Um, so yeah, thank you and welcome. Thanks. Well, the whole point of this work is to pay it forward, you know, spread it and make sure people learn, you know, more than was previously known about the brain and about mind body connections. So yes. that's why we're here. That's why I do this work. Yeah. Yes. Giving people hope is so powerful. Yeah. Um, so I have some high level questions for you and some um, kind of nitty gritty ones, and we'll just see where this goes. Um, and I also have a question from um, somebody who watches this channel that wanted me to ask you something. So I'll fit that in there someplace. But on just the big scale for people who are new to this, what is happening with chronic pain and why do we have so many millions of people just in the United States alone that are in pain and are not able to get out? Yeah, um, unfortunately, pain has increased in the US and worldwide, um, even among young people. There was one study that showed that one third of teenagers that had back pain which was unheard of when I started training. And I trained both as a pediatrician and an internal medicine doctor. So we saw a lot of kids. Um, anxiety and depression has increased dramatically in our population as well. Uh, and chronic pain and anxiety and depression are the major causes of disability worldwide. They're not the major causes of death, but they are the major causes of disability. And why are they increasing? Um, no one can say for 100% certain, but most chronic pain is not due to a structural problem in the body. Not all, obviously many, some people and many people can have chronic pain due to severely damaged joints or um, you know, cancer that has spread or autoimmune disorders that are um, untreated and not under control. But when you look overall, you know, big picture, like you were saying, mm -hmm. the majority of people with back and neck pain do not have a structural problem in their back or their neck. And this is a revolutionary and shocking statement. Most people with headaches don't have a disease in their head. Most people with irritable bowel, fibromyalgia, pelvic pain syndromes do not have diseases in the parts of their body where they have pain. So how can you have pain in an area of your body where you're not diseased, where you're not damaged, where you're not broken? How can that be? And how can that be so common? 
And the answer is, is that our brain creates what we experience in our body. So, and that's called predictive processing or predictive coding. And so most doctors are unaware of that neuroscience theory. And most doctors are unaware of how the brain works at that level. So there's a huge mismatch in society going on right now with more and more stress in society as evidenced by more and more anxiety and depression, but is also evidenced by more and more chronic pain because stress and emotions activate the brain to create anxiety, depression, fatigue, insomnia, and pain. And that's just a fact, but it's not one that's kind of widely known or accepted at this point in time. Yeah, yeah. I, um, on your recommendation, I read this book, which does a great job of um, helping to understand that predictive coding. It's called How Emotions Are Made, if anybody is interested. Yeah, that's a great book. It really has opened the eyes of many, many people. And I met Dr. Uh, Dr. Barrett a few months ago and oh. gave a talk to her her lab, which was very, uh, very cool and very, very exciting for me to, to speak with her. Yeah. Uh, you know, as a neuroscientist. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, so when it comes to predictive coding and expectations, um, assuming that that must have a pretty big role in recovering from chronic pain too. Yeah, well, it's important to understand what's causing it. And then we're using if, if, if we, and everyone needs, um, you know, everyone needs an assessment, you know, everyone needs an evaluation, you can't, we don't want to assume that all people with pain have a mind body type condition because some of them clearly won't. And so everyone needs that kind of assessment to make sure there's no structural problem in the body. And I'm a physician and I know that diseases do occur and can occur. And when I do find somebody who has a structural problem in the body, I'm, it's important to find that. I'm happy to report that and say, hey, this is something that needs more medical attention. It's not do not do simply to predictive coding and we also have to make sure that people understand that all pain is real that there's no such thing as imaginary pain or made up pain and that their pain is not all in their head because people kind of assume when you say there's that the brain is creating pain that you're implying that their pain isn't real and that's far from the case it's the opposite in fact because all pain is real all pain is created by the brain and so we're very careful and it's very important to make sure people know that they're not crazy, they're not making this up, uh, that yeah. almost everybody has had mind-body conditions. I have certainly had many instances of pain in my life that was not caused by a structural problem. And I'm happy to say that I don't have that kind of pain any longer, but I, I still sometimes get pain that's due to my brain because I'm human. Yeah. And so we're really helping people understand this is how the brain works. This is part of the human condition. Yeah. What, what percentage would you, would you guess of, of people who have symptoms are, um, are looking for a structural problem when in fact it ends up being a mind body condition? Well, um, if you take people with chronic headaches, it's very easy to rule out a structural problem on doing an MRI or CT of the brain, checking the eyes, the ears, the nose, the throat, the sinuses, et cetera. It's easy to rule out. And 95, roughly 95% of people with chronic headaches and head pain do not have a structural problem in fibromyalgia. It's by definition, there is not a structural problem. Irritable bowel syndrome, there is not a structural problem by definition because you've ruled out the diseases, the autoimmune type diseases that can cause similar symptoms. Um, with chronic pelvic pain syndromes, our experience is that it's about 90% is not structural. And shockingly with back and neck pain, a recent study that we did, and we're gonna be publishing it soon, uh, showed that roughly 85 to 90% of people with chronic neck and back pain did not have a structural problem to account for it. So, and this is, beyond, <laughs> we're talking about beyond the, uh, the Boulder back pain study. Was there a new study? 
Yeah, we have, no, there's another study we're, we're working on where oh. we did assessments of over 200 people. Okay, okay, great. Um, yeah, I've noticed that there seems to be uh, two studies that have kind of pinpointed one specific type of mind-body symptom, that's back pain and fibromyalgia. That's the, would that be correct in assuming that we have the most data pointing to those two? Yeah, those are the two areas where our research studies have focused so far. Um, but we're working with people at other institutions and we're hoping to expand our, our studies to incorporate other, other disorders. We're working with a guy who's working on migraine headaches. So we're hoping that that research study will get off the ground soon. And uh, we're working with somebody who's working on long COVID as well. I love that. Yes, that is, I would, I really want to see the, um, the results of that because I, I, we don't have to get into COVID too much, but COVID was very stressful. No matter where you stand on COVID issues around the country, it was very stressful. And so I, I suspect that that is a large reason why our numbers of, of chronic pain have gone up uh, because of the fear that, um, we had to experience. Absolutely. Yeah. Nothing more scary than a pandemic. You got to say. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, totally. So, um, yeah, one of the questions that, that I see a lot is, are my symptoms mind body, you know, and, and, or is my diagnosis, is this mind body? Um, and that question is, is always, um, an interesting one. <laughs> How do you tend to answer that? How do you rule in neural circuit or mind body um, syndrome? Well, you know, we use a, <clears throat> a, a three-step process. The first step is to rule out a structural problem. And that's done by any good physician who can do testing and examine people and check their backs and knees and stomachs and heads and everything and make sure that there's no clearly identifiable structural problem. One of the problems in that arena is that with knees and hips and shoulders and backs and necks, most people who get x-rays or MRIs of those areas will have some abnormalities. But it's important to understand that those abnormalities are common in people without pain as well. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we talk a lot about that. So that's, so that's the first step, not over-diagnosing a structural problem just because the x-ray or MRI shows some changes that are also seen in normal people. The second step is to rule in a neural circuit problem. And we do that by paying attention to the details of the story, of the history. Uh, is the pain in a broad, wide area of the body? Is the pain on one whole arm or one whole leg or one whole half of the body? Those are, those are situations that we call functional, where there's no disease that causes pain that would be in such a wide area. Um, is the pain, um, does it, did it come on for no reason? Did it just start out of the blue? Um, that's another hint or clue that this is a neural circuit problem or a mind-body problem. Is the pain inconsistent? Does it come and go? Does it turn on and off? Does it shift? Does it move? Has it spread over time? Uh, is it <clears throat> worse? Uh, after exercising, but not as much during exercise. Uh, so we have all these criteria that we use. And in addition, is it triggered? Is it triggered by innocuous things? Pain that hurts with light touch is mind-body pain. Pain that hurts when, it's, when you're exposed to cold or wind or the weather is mind-body pain. Uh, pain that's worse with stress likely to be mind-body pain. So there's a lot of these criteria that we use um, to help us not only rule out a structural problem, but also rule in a mind-body or a neural circuit problem. What, what do you say to people who, um, who their symptoms do align with things like weather? Well, um, what we do is we point to the research that weather doesn't actually damage our body, number one. Okay. And yes. we talk about how conditioned responses can occur and grow. And everyone knows about Pavlov and his dogs as a 
classic conditioned response. And, uh, and so we explain how that happens. And then we look for inconsistencies, right? Is there times when the weather is bad and there's less pain, the weather is good and there's more pain. So you, you can see in your own life that there's inconsistency in this. And when there's inconsistency, that points toward the brain. Uh, and then we also do things like what I call provocative testing, where I'll have people um, imagine the weather changing. And which sometimes when you imagine the weather changing, you'll actually start to get pain or you'll start to get your symptom. And then you know it's not actually the weather, it's just the brain. <laughs> so that's so kind of a, yeah. one, of the, one of our little tricks that we use. Yeah. And I and I pointed to the brain, but again, wanting to <laughs> emphasize what Howard just said that it's it is real pain caused. I'm not in any way implying that it is just in the in the mind. It is definitely in the body and real pain. Well, people, we know that you you can have pain in a limb that's been amputated. Yeah, we know you can have phantom limb pain, and it's not due to the foot. The foot is missing. It's due to the brain creating pain and when you touch a hot stove it's not your finger actually causing pain it's actually the brain causing pain and we know that because thousands of people have had injuries and had no pain so the brain doesn't have to turn on pain it can and it often usually does when there's an injury which is a good thing uh, because we need that kind of warning and protective mechanism uh, but the brain is the source of all pain. And so the pain that occurs due to an injury is exactly the same as the pain that occurs due to a stressful situation or an emotional situation. It's the same pain. So mm -hmm. it's all real. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you talk about this idea that the brain would rather experience physical pain than emotional pain? Um, you know, that's a, a theory that Dr. Sarno um, Mm -hmm. Fourth, uh, and Dr. Sarno was my teacher, and uh, he was a genius, really. And he, I love it. He was one of the first people to. I mean, the, the idea that the brain can cause pain, or that mind, or that you know emotions can con, can cause symptoms in the body, dates back to Roman times. And you know, it's not new; it's thousands of years old. But Dr. Sarno really codified it in the modern era in, in the last 30, 40 years. And uh, he made it popular. He wrote great books that people loved. And one of his theories was that the brain would preferentially create pain in order to avoid feeling emotions. Mm -hmm. And that's a theory and it makes sense. And it, it, it certainly may be true. We have no way of testing that. Right. Um, another way of thinking about why the brain creates pain due to a stressful or an emotional situation is that the brain has a danger alarm mechanism like a smoke alarm. And when there's enough smoke, the alarm goes off. And that the brain responds not only to physical pain when to turn on the physical injury to turn on the danger alarm mechanism, it also responds to emotional injury. So when we feel endangered in an emotional sense because of a difficult boss or a, a child or a spouse or a neighbor or whatever, or COVID or a political situation, um, the brain can turn on pain as a warning mechanism, as an alarm. So that's another way of thinking about it. Yeah. What, yeah. What are more, some of the more common things that, that you see people uh, being able to turn down that or recalibrate whatever that alarm system, what are some of the ways that, that we can kind of retrain the brain in some of those things to turn down the pain? Right. Well, our treatment model consists of first explaining how the brain works that was like we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. Secondly, um, assessing everyone to make sure that they do have a mind-body condition, not a structural one. Third, to help them see in their life why they might have it and the evidence for that so they really know that they're not actually structurally damaged. And so the treatment then consists of helping them calm their brain First, by knowing that they're not damaged. Second, by treating the sensations as less fear, less fearfully, with mm -hmm. less worry about them, less focus on them, less concern about them, 
less frustration with them, turning down all the mechanisms that feed that danger signal. And, um, and as they do that, then they're gonna start to see shifts in the sensations. And when the sensations start to shift, they can see more and more that, oh yeah, it is my brain. Oh yeah, I can get better, I will get better. I was just talking to a woman in the last hour and when I first saw her, she had constant pain around her abdomen. And now her pain is coming and going. So she's seen tremendous pride. The pain isn't gone yet. Is that hopeful for her? But that's incredibly hopeful. I was telling her how great she's doing, how yeah. wonderful this is that she's making progress because she's seen that she's seen it's not constant pain and it's turning on and off. When it's turning on and off, why is it turning on and off? Because it's her brain. And she went camping and it got worse. And she went to visit her mom who's really sick and it got worse. And she went out on her boat and it got better. So she's like seeing, well, my brain is responding to different situations. And so now she knows, she knows even more deeply that she's gonna be, she is okay and she's going to be okay. And that will fuel her recovery. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Um, one of my favorite things to hear people talk about is just this idea of compassion and the shifting of our inner dialogue and how we operate within our own mind space about ourselves. You- yeah, that's, it's a very important part of our treatment. In addition to dialing down the danger mechanism by changing our response to the sensations, we're also looking at the emotional milieu that people are living in. Yeah. And people mm-hmm. who, are, who are beating themselves up, who are putting a lot of pressure on themselves, who are thinking they're a loser and they're no good, people who um, put everybody else first and don't uh, give themselves credit or don't put themselves first sometimes. All those are ways of activating the danger signal because your brain is going to be thinking like things are not very good here. But we're, in a yeah. sense, we're doing it to ourselves. Mm-hmm. And everyone does this to some degree. The best people in the world are caring, loving people who put everyone else first. They're nice to be around, but sometimes you have to put yourself first and sometimes you have Mm -hmm. to take care of yourself. And that has to come out of compassion and caring for oneself. Sometimes people who've had traumatic childhoods or difficult childhoods have learned that they're not important, that they don't count and they don't matter. Sometimes they have learned that in order to get praise and attention, they have to, you know, put everybody else first and not attend to their own needs and not be selfish. And so this is part of the work that we do on the emotional level, on the emotional side of things to help people get better. Yeah. It took me like a very close look of really paying attention to what I said to myself internally to be able to catch on to, yeah, the fact that um, I wasn't very nice to myself and definitely was not encouraging and expected failure at every turn. Um, And um, it wasn't until this work that I stopped and was like, oh my gosh, no wonder I don't feel safe. I'm making my own body and brain to be a place that is in threat mode all the time. Right, and it's not your fault, it's what you learned. Yeah. You know, it's how you were raised and how, people are raised and often women are raised that way in our society. So, you know, we're not blaming anybody. We're not saying you're, you're at fault because you're doing it to yourself. We're saying mm-hmm. that's how you learn to adapt to the world. And what was adaptive as a child may not be quite as adaptive now mm-hmm. as an adult. Mm-hmm. And so the symptoms, when we think of this danger alarm mechanism in the brain, the symptoms, the pain or the fatigue or the insomnia or the anxiety or the depression, these symptoms are a message that our brain is sending. And the message is that you don't feel safe in some way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I I love to have people do is to look inside themselves and see if there's a message, if there's a reason for these symptoms, if there's something, if there was a deep internal guide within them, a spirit or a, 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 a spiritual being or a loving, loving self that 
that cares about them and loves them. What's the message there? Most people will find a message and then you're not looking at the symptoms as the enemy or as that your brain betraying you or trying to torture you or hurt you. You're looking at your brain as trying to send you a message and it just can't speak English. <laughs> but if we can yeah. transform the symptoms into a message that we can hear. Yeah. Such as you need to be kinder to yourself. You need yes. to take care of yourself. You need to love yourself. You need to stand up for yourself. You know, those yeah. kinds of things. If there's a message there, wow, that can change your whole life. And you can view these symptoms as, like I say, not the enemy, but as a guide, as a guiding force to help move you to becoming the person that you want or need to be. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's one of the things I'm, I'm grateful for when it comes to the symptoms, because even when you have healed from you don't heal from the mind body connection. So when you heal from chronic pain, um, my body, your body will oftentimes still remind you if you fall into these, these fear based patterns. And even today, just like this morning had a little little inkling of these sensations and, and it was my pain telling me, I don't, I don't want you to worry about this interview with Dr. Howard Schubiner. I want you to trust that it is going to go, go good and, and, and believe in that and, and trust God in it and, and go forth. And as soon as I was like, oh, yeah, mm -hmm. I, this is not about me performing, uh, my sensations were like, we're good. Mm -hmm. you know. And, and, I, and I think that's awesome because it really wants kind of freedom. Uh, I think the, the pain is often pointing us towards a deeper freedom that is just beautiful. So. Yeah, I mean, that's what we do. Human beings are, are meaning making machines. We try to make meaning. We try to understand our world. And that's what human beings have been doing for millennia. And this is part of that. And what you just described and what you did for yourself was a way of making a meaning and understanding yourself at a deeper level and coming to peace with yourself, which is you know, when you come to peace with yourself, you know, yeah. chances are you're not going to be suffering as much. Yep. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, so here's a question that somebody emailed me. And I kind of I like the question because of the answer. Um, I wanted to ask if anyone can inherit fibromyalgia from their parents. And if yes, then will they be able to heal? Hmm. Sure. Well, we fibromyalgia is not inherited in the sense that uh, genetic diseases are inherited, such as sickle cell anemia can be inherited in your genes. Cystic fibrosis can be inherited in your genes. And if you have those genes, uh, then you're going to have that disease. Fibromyalgia does not work that way. Migraine headache does not work that way. Um, and so there's different ways of thinking about that. One thing is, is that children growing up in an environment tend to learn from that environment, obviously. So if you grow up having a parent with fibromyalgia or having a parent with migraine headaches, your brain is learning that, seeing that, you know, engaged in that. And um, it's more likely that when you have stress in your life, your brain would default to that symptom because when stress and emotions occur, your brain has to choose some something. It can choose back pain, it can choose headaches, it can choose fibromyalgia, it can choose anxiety or all the above, right? Mm -hmm. so, so there's modeling. I saw a woman earlier today who her one of her relatives told her when she was young, told her stories about story about a woman who had really severe facial pain called trigeminal neuralgia. And so she had, that his, she had that story in her mind. 50 years later, she was in a very stressful situation and guess what she got? She got trigeminal neuralgia. <laughs> her brain just latched onto that and now she's getting better from it and she's gonna be fine. So that's one way of understanding how our parents can affect us by modeling, by, by what we learn in our childhood. Now, there are also genetic predispositions for things like migraine headaches, like anxiety, depression. And those are best understood as what we would call epigenetic disorders. So an epigenetic disorder means that you, have, you can get the genes for that disorder, but the genes don't 
mean you will get it. The genes mean you have a predisposition toward it. But these types of genes can be turned on and turned off. And then the environment plays a major factor in turning on these genes or turning them off. So it goes back to stress and emotional situations that can activate the genes for depression or migraine or can deactivate them. So this mind-body healing work is very effective in these conditions of fibromyalgia, migraine headache, anxiety, depression. Um, so that would be how I would answer that. So much hope. Yes, so much hope. Um, which is why I just love this work. Um, okay, your story about the trigeminal neuralgia. Is there, um, is there popular <laughs> syndromes? Popular syndromes, yeah. Well, what happens is uh, if you read the history of, of mind-body disorders, the history shows that different syndromes occur at different points in time over the years over hundreds of years and occur in different places in the world. So certain of these mind-body conditions are more common in certain countries versus other countries. Yeah. Uh, that is very well studied, very well known. There's a great book called The Sleeping Beauties by Suzanne O'Sullivan. And okay. she talks about this and I would recommend that book. Um, Can you say the name of the book again? The, the Sleeping Beauties. Okay. Suzanne O'Sullivan. Um, and we know that certain conditions can be contagious. There have been many instances where certain mind-body conditions have, have grown and occurred over time. I mean, there's one, there's so many cases, there's hundreds of these stories. Uh, one of these was there was somebody who, I think somebody who got sick or vomited on a plane, and somehow the message got out that the air was bad. And all of a sudden there were half the plane was all vomiting. There was nothing wrong with any, I mean, one person yeah. may have had the flu, but everybody else, it was just contagious and they yeah. got, everyone got upset and their brain just turned all these symptoms. Over time, you know, RSI, repetitive, uh, repetitive um, strain injury has been contagious and has gone up and gone down. Um, in, uh, in recent years, we've had, ep you know, kind of mini epidemics of chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, um, POTS, POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, that's been coming up more. People are more afflicted lately with uh, mild forms of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or hyperflexibility. And so there is, mm -hmm. there is definitely uh, the, the mold that you, uh, mold toxicity, electromagnetic field toxicity. There's all these things that people get afraid of. And Many, you know, a lot of times it's not only that it's people that are afraid of them, but doctors and, mm -hmm. and well-meaning therapists Family. promoting these ideas that these things are all dangerous or damaging, and then it just yeah. makes it worse. Yeah, yeah. Did, um, did carpal tunnel fall under that category of popular mind-body syndromes? Probably. Probably. What happens with carpal tunnel is that people may get hand pain and everyone assumes and even the, sometimes doctors will confirm that it's carpal tunnel when it actually isn't. For example, yeah. if you have pain in all five fingers, it can't be carpal tunnel because the carpal tunnel affects only the median nerve, which only goes to the first three fingers. So a lot nice. of times people okay. say, oh, I've got carpal tunnel when in actuality it's not. Yeah, I was, that was one of my many diagnosis was oh, right. um was carpal tunnel and i do not have carpal tunnel <laughs> i dropped out of design school and everything because my you know my wrists they were so painful and yeah. that was the only um possible reason for it right my my well-intentioned doctor assumed that it was carpal tunnel and so that's the the uh what i went on and yeah. that means don't use my hand as much as possible you know yeah yeah. 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 That's sad. It's sad that so many people are suffering. It is, it's truly a, a massive uh, epidemic, but as you were pointing out, and the reason for you doing this work and helping others is that there is hope for so many of us. Yeah. Where do you see this going? I mean, I don't know if it's just because now I'm in, enlightened, um, but now I see 
you know, I see articles, well, I see your name everywhere, but I see articles and I see, you know, news things and, and books coming out. And it just seems, it seems to be um, gaining, and it's becoming more known that this is a thing, this is real. Um, and so, I mean, it, it, the way that I look at it is it seems that we have doctors that are experts in the body and we have psychologists that are experts in our thoughts. Um, and we don't have a lot of people that are in the middle um, being able to to draw the lines and point people in, in this direction. Where do you see this this going as as this information gets out there more? How do we well, resolve we're, this? We're, hope, we're hoping for a tipping point. You know, we're hoping, I, you know, you can't keep a good idea down forever, <laughs> right? Victor Hugo said, there's nothing more powerful than an, than an idea whose time has come. Mm. Yeah. And- uh, It is time. It's time. Yeah. <laughs> it's time. So, uh, you know, I like to say, you know, I'm, you know, kind of, you know, healing the world one person at a time. You know, we can only do what we can do one person at a time. But, you know, the work you're doing, the work so many other people are doing who get inspired by this work, write articles about it, do research on it, give lectures, do podcasts. All of this is informing you know, the general population. And at some point that these ideas will become the norm, they'll become well accepted. Dr. Sarno had a, you know, tremendous hope that his ideas would be accepted in regular traditional mainstream medicine in his lifetime. That didn't happen. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he, he passed away when he was in his 90s. And you know, I've got a few more years left, so I'm, I'm hoping it'll happen in my, my lifetime. But if it doesn't happen in my lifetime, it'll happen in your lifetime. Yeah, I hope so. Um, this is just reminding me of when I was in horrific life stealing pain. And I went to my physical therapist again for the, you know, <laughs> hundredth time or whatever. Um, but every time I would go to him, I wouldn't have pain. Um, and he was so, he was such a kind, listening, amazing person um, that just had a few things off <laughs> about what was wrong with me and that scared me. Um, and so I didn't heal, but when I was there, I would have the pain, the pain signal would just turn off and I'd be good to go until mm -hmm. I went home. Um, but, but then um, what I didn't know had happened is that I, I started having back pain from picking something up. Well, it was a log, but nonetheless, I had picked up something and quote unquote, hurt my back, you know? Um, and so for the next three months, this was before I discovered the mind-body syndrome, um, I had horrible back pain and I babied my back and uh, I had seen a different, I was seeing a different pain specialist who was not helpful. Um, and he had me baby my back. And then I went back to that physical therapist and he said to me, oh, this is, you just have like an inverted something, something, something. Um, and he gave me a structural diagnosis but then he said to me, but it won't hinder you at all. Just don't pick up anything over 400 pounds. And he <laughs> laughed, you know, um, and, um, and I left and was literally 60% pain gone just mm. by him. I mean, he, he had still told me there was something structurally wrong. And yet the message that I would be okay to live, the pain was like, oh, I'm good, you know, and then I went off and lived my life. Well, mm -hmm. not quite that simple, but yeah. Well, he helped you take lower the fear. Yeah. And give hope at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. So, and sm with a smile, there, those are three really powerful ways of changing neural circuits in the brain. Yeah. Yeah. So helpful. Um, okay. So I also just want to dip briefly into the Boulder back pain study and just kind of the outcomes of that with um, imaging and your thoughts on, on all of that, if you would. Yeah, well, we, we did a study in Boulder, Colorado with the lab of Tor Wager, a very famous and amazing neuroscientist. Mm -hmm. Study was run by Yoni Ashar, who was a grad student at the time. And uh, we randomized people into three arms, people with chronic back pain of 10 years duration of back pain. And a third of them got treatment as usual, no, nothing special. We just followed them over time. A third of them got a back injection, which was a placebo injection. And a third of them got our form of mind-body uh, treatment, mind-body therapy. 
and it's a specific type of therapy that we're calling pain reprocessing therapy. This therapy was delivered by two uh, great uh, behavioral medicine people, Alan Gordon and Christy Weepy. Mm -hmm. And 75% uh, of the people we treated were pain-free and within one month uh, with chronic back pain for 10 years. So it was really an amazing result. Yeah. Uh, there's never been a back pain study of chronic back pain that showed that kind of fantastic results. Yeah, 75%, that's amazing. Yeah, well, 33 out of the 44. So it was a smaller study, but we did, as you pointed out, we did fMRIs of the brain of all these folks. And we found changes, very clear changes in the brain in people whose pain went away, mm -hmm. showing that the neural circuits in the brain were being rewired, were changing. And that's how we treated people. And uh, so we use the methods that are written about in Alan's book, The Way Out, uh -huh. written about in my book, Unlearn Your Pain, and many other people's books, Dr. Hanscom Schechter, Georgie Oldfield, Dave Clark, yeah. um, a lot of other uh, books that people can access. And uh, so we were excited about that. And, and you know, now we're just hopefully moving on to more studies. Yeah, I, I think I remember hearing you did a check-in. How long after the um, research did you, was it a year later and you checked in with them? Yeah, we have one year follow up. So it wasn't okay. a trans, it wasn't a transient change in pain. It was a sustained yeah. change in pain. One year later, the, the pain scores were just as, as low, maybe it's slightly higher over time, but, but basically uh, the, the pain relief was sustained over one year. So it's not just a flash in the pan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because I, I, consider it or call it maintenance just this this idea of you saying it went up just a tiny bit and i think for me it is important that i i take care of myself and so you know my my healing i do i have your book well i have a couple of your books here but just this is his unlearn your pain book um and <clears throat> i did it online so you could at the time that i did it it was available as a course online um and i think that i did every single thing in um in that program like some people read this book and then not do the work right um but i think i did everything and it was so just freeing and i often tell people that i healed emotionally mentally spiritually and then physically and the physically was the least important of all of them like i'll take these ones and until you've experienced that i don't think people quite understand this this stuff is is this is heavy stuff um so all that to say, um, this maintenance thing, our lives are not just stressful, pre be like pre understanding mind body condition. Um, it's stressful there too. And so this this taking care of myself and resolving things and, and for me, it's allowing God to come in and bring me freedom in these areas um, is a maintenance thing. So I think it is important that once we start to understand this, we continue to do the, the work. If well, you if you if you understand people, you understand how the brain works, you understand life, you'll understand that stress occurs in life. Yeah. And when stress occurs, the brain may decide to turn on some sort of warning signal yeah. of some kind. And it may be a small one, it might be a big one, uh, depending on the stress, depending on people's prior experiences. But nevertheless, mm -hmm. the point is, is that our brain can always turn on some sort of warning message, but it's up to us to, to understand the message and interpret the message. Mm -hmm. And if we need to go to the doctor to figure out if we have a, a, a true injury or a true structural problem, fine, we should do that. But when they don't find one and the brain is turning on some symptom, we can look at our life and see what's going on in our life. Yeah. What might need addressing? What, how do we need to, as you pointed out, how do we need to do the maintenance or take care of ourselves? And those are great lessons over time. Yep. Yep. Brings lots of health and freedom. Um, do you have any final statements or anything that you feel is important for anybody who's either stuck or just learning, just starting this journey? Um, any nuggets of wisdom? I think the main thing is to be open, to be open-minded. It's very easy to get stuck in a pattern, stuck in a thought pattern, stuck in what other people have have told you or what you've been told. Um, 
people often need to challenge some assumptions such as, oh, I'm, I have this symptom because of mold, or I have this symptom because of nerve damage, or I have this symptom because of um, you know, the weather. So being open is so important. And if people can be open to learning and, and investigating, then they'll usually come to the truth if you just keep looking. It's when people close off and don't look at certain options or don't, mm -hmm. don't consider other possibilities that they feel that they get stuck. And when you get stuck, that can be incredibly frustrating and depressing and they feel like they have nowhere to go. And so this, this, this work opens up opportunities if people are willing to kind of break outside of their prison. Uh, prison stuckness yeah <laughs> yeah okay great thank you well i just appreciate your time i appreciate you like i was saying in the beginning and um yeah enjoyed having you today so. thanks so much jennifer you take care you too thanks Bye.